and welcome to week four, lecture two of CO442642 graph theory. Today we'll be talking about coloring and list coloring planar graphs. So where should we start? Well, perhaps with the conjecture slash theorem that you have all heard of, the four color conjecture. What is the four color conjecture? Well, it was made by Guthrie in 1852, and it says that every planar graph is four colorable. So while looking at maps, they began to wonder whether you could color a map such that all the countries have only used four colors and adjacent countries don't receive the same color. This, of course, by duality can be thought of as coloring planar graphs. That was the four color conjecture. What you might not know is that it has an equivalent form, which we'll get to later in the semester when we talk about flows and coloring flow duality, but it goes something like this. The four color conjecture is equivalent to saying that every bridgeless cubic planar graph is three edge color. So we talked about edge coloring last week, and so here we'd be looking at planar graphs that are cubic, but also that are, are bridgeless, so they don't have an, one edge cuts. And the conjecture there then is that these are three edge colorable. So by visings, we know they'd have edge coloring at most four, and at least three because they might, for example, be K4, but can you actually do it with three colors? And it turns out that conjecture is an equivalent formulation of the four color conjecture. So in case you didn't know that, uh, very nice. So it, tying back in with edge coloring. And as you all might know, eventually this was proved by Oppel and Hawken in the 1970s that every planar graph is four color. So let me talk a little bit about the proof. So of course we can't do it as very long and computer based, but what how does it generally go? Well, it uses the method of discharging invented by Heesh in the 50s and or 60s as a way to attack the four color problem. And we'll talk maybe more about that later, but what does it do? It uses this discharging method to show that every minimum counterexample contains one of 1,834 unavoidable configurations. So somehow you do kind of a counting argument and you have these charges and you rearrange them and you argue that a minimum counterexample, so if you're planar with certain properties, say, you know, five connected, min degree five, that kind of thing, then you actually have to contain one of these unavoidable configurations. What do you then do? Well, as we alluded to before, it's kind of, you have reductions and some other argument. Well, here's where the reductions come in. So you'd actually argue that each of these configurations is reducible. That does not occur in a minimum counterexample that you can do some combination of identifying vertices, deleting edges, etc., that will then, if you have a coloring of a smaller graph, would extend to a coloring of the larger graph. So again, an art form, a combination of discharging to show that these are unavoidable and reductions to show that they can't actually happen in minimum counterexamples. And now the point about this is this was a computer-based proof. So each of these parts took uh, very long on the computer, at least back in the 70s then, to, to show. And, and the ended up publishing a book in 89 that's hundreds of pages and to do all the things. But you'd need computer at least to, to check all the reducible, as there could be maybe a million or a billion different cases to check that these, no matter how the coloring of the smaller graph is, it extends to these larger ones after the reductions. So the, needless to say, the four color theorem was controversial as it was the first major mathematical theorem to be proved with computer assistance. And so it was not generally accepted at the time. And indeed, it maybe was not accepted for a long time, but then a second proof was developed and a shorter one that only used 633 configurations by Robertson, Sanders, Seymour, and Thomas in 97. And that one was nicer because it had a smaller number of configurations but also because the discharging part was more done by hand so that you could more straightforwardly follow the actual brunt of the proof and you just had to trust that the computer could do these uh, extensions of colorings correctly. Also by that time computers of course had, had improved and by nowadays probably if you ran the computer part of the proof even on your iPhone it might only take 10 seconds or, or a minute. It doesn't take much computing power from the viewpoint of nowadays. But there was that sort of proof, and that then became more generally accepted as, as showing that it is indeed true. 
And actually, that latter proof was actually verified by formal proof software, uh, the Cox system, in 2005. So it was run through. What does that mean? Well, the complaints of various people were, how can you really uh, mathematically trust computers? So, you know, not only do you have to trust the code that the people wrote to do the program, that it does what they say, but on even a more fundamental uh, epistemological level, you have to wonder if the computers themselves might not have problems, right? Computers are, are machines, they are in the real world, they could create errors, they could have a bit that goes haywire and do a calculation wrong. Sure, that's very, very unlikely, but, you know, maybe a one in a million, one in a billion chance, but it could be. And then you could ask, well, okay, so maybe you program in a different way, run on a different computer, because maybe this is the computer that's the flaw, that they're going to give the same calculation the wrong way. So you run on other ones, but again, you could argue, what if there's a one in a million chance for each of these? Sure, you then reduce the chances, but maybe the universe is conspiring, conspiring to show us that the four color theorem is true when it's really false. So how can you trust it? Well, these formal proof verification softwares, what they do is they take whatever was written, whatever the steps, and they convert them just into line by line logic. So in some way, it would create a, an output of a line-by-line -line set of logical statements that could be verified by hand, any one part of it. And so it, it's not perfect in that it still uses a computer, but it, it has a, a whole system. So as long as you trust that this one system of converting things into logic and that checking that the logical facts are true works, then you can have much more confidence that the four-color theorem and other related such theorems that are used proved by computer assistants are true. So this was kind of a breakthrough then. I think nowadays most people are of the opinion that computers can do a lot of things and we trust them uh, to prove the theorems if people are careful and know what they're doing. But that was kind of the history of that proof and how they resolved this major hundred and plus year old problem. And that's, that's the state that was then. But now what? Well, let me talk a little bit about what if we wanted better than four colors. So can we use fewer colors by excluding certain subgraphs? And as the hint suggests, the triangle free might be an idea. And indeed, this is a theorem. So it's Groetsch's theorem uh, that every planar triangle free graph is three color. And Groetsch's theorem actually, it doesn't say it here, but predates the four color theorem. So it's from 1959. Uh, arguably, he had done it during the middle of the Second World War and didn't publish it for another decade but it predated the, color, uh, the four color theorem by almost 20 years. So that was Groetsch's theorem. So even if we couldn't prove the four color theorem, we could prove something stronger back then than if you exclude triangles, you could even do three color. Now, of course, you could do four colorable very easily by a degeneracy argument, as triangle-free planar graphs are three degenerate. But here, three colors suffice. So that's a very beautiful theorem. And if we had more time, we would do various proofs of that. There's now many different proofs, but that was a, a known classical theorem from the 1950s. And here's a question, since we've spent a lot of time asking, talking about list coloring, is does Groetsch's extend to list coloring? Well, no, because Margit Voigt, again, in 1995, showed that there exists a planar triangle free graph that is not three list colorable. So if you remember our discussion about the four color theorem from last class, did it extend? No, Voigt had shown uh, that there is one, a planar graph that's not four list colorable. And then Thomason came in and showed that there are five list colorable. Here, Groetsch's theorem also doesn't extend to list coloring, but in the same year, Thomason in 1995 proved that every planar graph of girth of these five. So if you exclude triangles or four cycles, then those are three color, well, three list colorable rather. Uh, so it's, of course, the three colorable by Groetsch's, but so small typo there. So it should say is three list colorable. All right, so that kind of concludes this triangle free. So triangle free, three colorable, not three list colorable. If you include four cycles as well, three list colorable. Then what? Well, here's another conjecture that arose to prominence from 1976, and it's Steinberg's conjecture. And it says that every planar graph without four cycles or five cycles is three colorable. So maybe you want to allow triangles, but maybe you then have to exclude more. So the conjecture was, Four and excluding fours and fives doesn't. So there are examples I won't go through. 
that if you just exclude fours, there's a counterexample. If you exclude just fives, there's a counterexample. But it may if you excluded both. The conjecture was that this works. Well, people got stuck as this conjecture seemed very hard. And so Erdős came along in 91 and said to try to make people work on the problem more, here's something easier. What is the smallest k such that planar graphs with no cycles of length 4 to k are 3 colorable? So it, there's some easy arguments to show that 4 to 11 works, and then 4 to 10 works, and then people did 4 to 9, and so on. And the best known result is by Borodin, Glibov, Raspo, and Savala Vatapur that k equals 7 works from 2005. That's a very nice discharging reducible configuration type proof, uh, similar to the four colors, but only in maybe 10 or 15 pages. So four to seven works, and then people got stuck. They couldn't really do better. And maybe that shouldn't be surprising because as it turned out by a 2016 result, Steinberg's is false. So Cohen, Haddad, Habdiga, Kral, Lee, and Salgado had constructed a counterexample. So they made, again, kind of little gadgets and combined them to show that you cannot actually get a three coloring uh, while not having four or five cycles. So this was kind of a big blow. 40 years this conjecture stood. And, and you know, if you ask various people, mo most thought it was true. They, people, it even made stronger conjectures, harder conjectures, saying, well, uh, you know, every planar graph without, you know, four cycle or without adjacent triangles and five cycles is three colorable, for example. And, and those harder conjectures are now also false. So maybe it's a lesson for the math community. Maybe people haven't worked hard enough on finding counterexamples um, where you just want to believe things are true, but this, this old conjecture fell. It's still open, I'll mention, whether four to six works. So four to five, no. Four to seven, yes, and four to six open seems very hard. And then you might ask, lastly, what about list coloring? So it was known it was false for list coloring even long ago. But, well, four to six may be open. Uh, four to seven is also open because the best result is by Dvorak and myself that showed that node four to eight is three list colorable if you're planar. And that's a 2018 result. So this is the state of excluding non-triangles. Uh, what else could we ask about? Well, here I'll just mention kind of two more general questions on planar graphs. So you might think, okay, we did planar graphs, that's the four color theorem, we had Thomason's theorem, exclude triangles, exclude triangles of four cycles, exclude four to k cycles. There's nothing more you can ask. Well, you could ask a lot of different other questions. And so I'll just give you a sampling of some of those. So here's one I think is very natural. It says, if a theorem guarantees one k coloring, could we also prove a theorem guaranteeing many k colorings, right? So in each of those theorems, you know, the four color theorem, Thomason's theorem, etc., you're, you're always guaranteed a coloring. You might want to ask for many distinct colorings. Is that always possible? When can we do it? You know, could we get um, exponentially many? So we'll talk through some of that. But here's maybe a, a different take, different kind of direction to go in is so if a theorem guarantees again one k coloring could we also prove a theorem guaranteeing a k coloring if we add a few quote anomalies so i'll talk through this but maybe you want to allow some of the vertices to be pre-colored so they have already specified their color or kind of smaller list sizes if you're doing list coloring or maybe we want to add crossings so somehow you you tweak it so that there's maybe a few hard parts of the graph to to try to color and can we still get colorings in those additional circumstances. So these are the two kind of natural directions. So what does that mean? Well, you know, let's talk about the first one. So exponentially many colorings. Can you find many colors? So here's a very basic question uh, that maybe you can think through and answer. Do all planar graphs have exponentially many four colorings? What do I mean by exponential? In the number of vertices. So a graph on n vertices, does it have two to the cn number of four colorings for some constant c? That works for all graphs, all planar graphs. So stop and pause and think a second and try to answer this question. So what's the answer? It's no. So here's a simple construction. You, you start with a k4 and inside facial triangles you'd add a new vertex adjacent to all the triangle, like degree three, and just keep repeating this. And you'll notice what happens is that the resulting graph has a unique four coloring 
at least up to permutation of colors, right? If I have a K4, it only has one four coloring uh, up to a permutation of colors. They all need different colors. And then if you put a vertex inside a triangle, it has to be colored different than those vertices and so on. So it forces, this construction forces the, the four coloring. Once you've made an initial choice of those colors, it forces the four color. So really, there are not exponentially many four colors. So you can't extend the four color theorem in that way. But here's a nice question. Do all planar graphs have exponentially many five colors? So what if I allow you another color, right? So remember the five color theorem, quite easy to prove. Maybe there's hope then that you can actually find many colors. Uh, so this was a question and the answer, you know, if you want to stop and think about it, but the answer is yes. But why is the question? Why is this true? What, how do we give a proof? So here's one proof, and it's very nice. It's the following proposition. Every graph has at least two to the v of g over chi of g, chi of g plus one color. So this is not about planar graphs at all. If I give you a graph and I allow you one extra color, you always get kind of exponentially many colorings, at least uh, where the constant's allowed to depend on chi. So for planar graphs, you know, we get 2 to the v over 4. And maybe stop and think, what's the proof of this? So then I'll show you. So here's the proof. You just take the largest color class in our chi of g coloring, and you recolor any subset with this extra color, right? So you know you have, a pretty op you have an optimum coloring. So then what's the extra color do? You can recolor vertices with the extra color. In, in particular, you could do that if they're not adjacent. So for example, if they had the same original color. And so there'd be that number of choices, right? The, the largest color class would have to be at least V over chi uh, size, and then you could choose any subset. So you get two to that number number of chi plus one color. It's a very nice little proposition if you haven't seen it before. So one extra color always gives you exponentially many colorings. So what does that mean? Then obviously planar graphs have exponentially many five colorings. That's by the four color theorem. This seems like crazy overkill though. If you use the four color theorem to show that, similarly planar triangle free graphs would have exponentially many four colorings that would follow from Groch's theorem because they're three colorable. So that one extra give you exponentially many four colorings. So you might complain that that seems like a lot of overkill. And indeed uh, there's an exercise in the homework giving uh, proofs that don't rely on four color theorem and Groch's theorem. And then you might wonder if triangle free graphs that are planar have exponentially many three colorings. So I said no for four color theorem, but maybe Groch's theorem extends. And that is indeed still an open conjecture of, of Thomason that they do. The best known result is that planar triangle free graphs have two to the square root v of g over 212 many three colorings. And that's a result by Asadi, Dvorak, uh, myself, and Thomas. And what else? So there was that result. And then there's the, another result for girth five. So Thomason showed that planar graphs of girth at least five have exponentially many three colorings. So a natural question is, do these as results extend to list colorings? And the answer is yes, actually. So Thomason in 2007 showed that if you are a planar graph and you have a five list assignment, then you actually have exponentially many distinct L colorings. So he had shown, he basically extended his own theorem to exponential case. Uh, with my student, Tom Kelly, uh, we had shown in 2018 that this also works for uh, triangle free and four list color, four list assignments. And then Thomason in 2007 had shown that his uh, planar growth five result that works, that you get exponentially many three list colorings. There was much worse cost of two to the V over 10,000 there. So all of these extend. So that's all I wanted to say about the, the exponential case. Uh, let's talk about the anomalies question. So here's, for example, one theorem. So Aksinov in 74 had extended Groch's theorem to the following case. Every planar graph with at most three triangles is three colorable. So if I allow you three different triangles, uh, they can overlap or what? As long as the whole graph has at most three triangles, you're three colorable. So this is, this is what I mean by anomaly. So I'll allow one bad thing, one triangle, you know, three triangles. And actually there's a very nice conjecture of Havel from 1969, which goes as follows. There exists a D greater than zero such that every planar graph where every pair of triangles is at distance at least D apart is three colorable. So Havel was wondering, okay, you know, we know it holds maybe with one triangle. Could you hold it 
as long as all the triangles are far apart. So kind of locally, the, there's, you know, locally there's allowed to be one triangle, but none, no pair of them are close. So that's a very nice and appealing conjecture, a, a far-reaching generalization of Kirchhoff's theorem, and it wasn't solved until basically around 2008, but a series of papers still actually being published to this day uh, by Dvorak, Kral, and Thomas. And what did Dvorak uh, also show was that you could extend the uh, colorings, the three list colorings to these cases. That for Thomason's theorem, you can, if you're wondering list coloring, you know you're not allowed uh, the four cycles, but if you say every pair of it loves four cycles as a distance at least d, then that's three list colorable. Oh, another kind of direction is to look at pre-colored vertices. So here was a question that Thomason asked, I think it's very nice. Does there exist d greater than zero such that if g is a planar graph and x is a set of vertices at least d, pairwise far apart, then every five coloring of x extends to g? Well, the answer is yes, and it's a very nice uh, result by Albertson from the following year. He showed the following. If g is a planar graph and x is a set of vertices at least fair, four pairwise far apart, then every chi plus one coloring of x extends to g. So actually, you don't even need planar here, and I'll show you why. So this just works for every graph. You can always get uh, pre-coloring. You can allow pre-colored vertices as long as they're distance four apart. And the proof is, take a, a canonical coloring. Okay, great. Then what? Well, now you have these vertices in X. Let's call them XI. They have some preferred color CI, so you need to recolor them. Do that. Now what's the problem? Well, the neighbors of XI might have wanted the color CI for themselves. Luckily, we have an extra color, the chi plus one color. So we'll recolor all the neighbors that, uh, that were colored CI to color chi plus one. Is that a problem? No, this actually yields a chi plus one coloring of G. Why? So again, maybe stop, pause, and think about that. So why is it? Well, think about it. The NXI are the only ones that got recolored. And those NXI are disjoint because there's no two XI distance two, but they're also non-adjacent. There are no edges because they're distance at least three. And so what does it mean? It means that this will actually yield a color. So the ones around an individual one are, are, are of course, not adjacent because they're colored CI, but the ones uh, further apart, they'll know. So you won't end up with two vertices, chi, color chi plus one, that are adjacent, so this will end up with a color. So that's a very nice little proof by Albertson uh, showing that, indeed, you could do this. And again, you don't need planar. They're just any, um, any graph. You can pre-color if you, if you allow me that one extra color and distance at least four. But you might wonder about list coloring. So list coloring, we can't just do this recoloring trick. Uh, well, what was known there, well, at least you're allowed to pre-color one vertex, well, actually two adjacent ones by Thomason's theorem. So you might wonder the same, or what about if the vertices are pairwise far apart? And actually, Al Albertson in that paper where he resolved the Thomason's question asked for this list coloring. Does there exist a d greater than zero if every planar graph where you've pre-colored vertices a distance at least d is five less color? So I give you a five less assignment, but you have kind of pre-colored vertices, can it, does it extend? And we were able to resolve this uh, in 2017 with Dvorak, Leditsky, uh, Mohar, and myself. And the d is, you know, somewhere in like the 10,000s, but it, it is true. And lastly, just to end on one more, what about crossings? I think this one's nice. So here's a very nice theorem by Dvorak, Leditsky, and Mohar from 2017 that every graph drawn on the plane with crossings at least distance 15 apart is five less colorable. So that's a very nice theorem, and 15 is a very reasonable number. So what is it saying? Well, remember back in the map thing, so if you had, you're allowed crossings. So you draw on the plane, but you're allowed crossings. So what you should think is kind of, you're allowed local little K4s. So maybe, you know, if you've seen the U.S. map with the four corner states, the four states that meet in a corner, you're basically allowing those. And as long as those little anomalies are distance 15 apart, then you can still get uh, a five coloring and a five list coloring. So of course, you could get a five coloring because you could just use uh, kind of Albertsons to recolor in the four color theorem. But impressively, you also get a five list coloring as well. So that's nice. 
And then lastly, I'll just mention my own theorem, uh, still in, in getting in preparation, but basically, or sorry, in publication, it says that the same holds for girth five and three list coloring. So if you allow crossings far apart, then you're actually three list colorable uh, in the girth five case. So today we talked through, you know, uh, the four color theorem a bit, this Groetsch's theorem, Thomason's uh, theorem for girth five and three list coloring, all very nice, some about Steinberg's, and then we talked about these kind of additional directional questions I just think are nice, other directions to go in that people have worked on. You know, can you get many colorings? Uh, and you saw Albertson's, um, you saw the nice proposition there, and then, you know, can you pre-color vertices or add these anomalies? We saw a nice little proof there. And then you have these kind of harder works. But just kind of, so that'll be, that's it for what I wanted to say about coloring uh, planar graphs and list coloring planar graphs. Uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the discharging method in general, but then we'll also be moving on to coloring and maybe list coloring graphs on surfaces and ask some questions there. So until next time, see you then.